This exercise may be uh, easier for some of you than others, but I want you to imagine for a moment that, uh, that you are married and that your spouse is a domineering person. Now, no elbowing the person next to you. But I mean a truly domineering person, Mr. or Mrs. Perfection. Not Mr. or Mrs. Perfect. I don't know who Mr. Perfect is, but I'm married to Mrs. Perfect in this room. Um, But Mr. or Mrs. Perfection, someone who demands perfection in every part of life. I want you to imagine uh, that for a minute. And it isn't just that they demand a lot of themselves. They demand a lot of you, too. So every morning you wake to a, to a list of things that have to be done both thoroughly and perfectly that day without error in any way, and you have to do them every day. Thinking about doing them isn't enough. You actually have to do them. You have to do them perfectly. You have to do them thoroughly, and you have to do them every day. No down day. No rest day, no half attempts are tolerated, no room for a a bad day or an off day, no concession to weakness or illness can be made, no excuses, no explanations for anything less perfection are accepted. There's absolutely no flexibility, no grace at all. Every failure, no matter how great or small, results in your being cursed for your ineptitude or your incompetence. And and every day, that person, that spouse, he or she comes home and asks, so how was your day? Did you do what I told you to do? Did Did you make the kids behave? Did you waste any time at all? Did you complete everything I put on your to-do list? So many demands and expectations. But no matter how hard you try, you can't be perfect. We could never satisfy that spouse, could we? We, 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 we forget things that are important to them. We, we let the children misbehave. We, we fail in other ways. That'd be a miserable marriage, wouldn't it? it would be, and Bob's like, yes, it would. No, thank you. The spouse always pointing out your failings. And the worst of it was that he or she was always right. But the remedy was always the same. Do better tomorrow. Try harder tomorrow. But you didn't because you couldn't. And then adding insult to injury, your demanding and now enraged spouse actually lives in inflexible adherence to to his or her own impossible demands. And they do it absolutely perfectly, humiliating you even more. It'd be no surprise if a very frustrated and beaten down you, living under that kind of pressure, lashed out in anger and fear, would it? You'd be constantly living in anger and in fear of failure, fear of messing up in any way. Now, sadly, and we don't realize it, but most of us are living that way every day, or at least most days. You see, we mistakenly believe that we have to be perfect. And since no one can be perfect, we believe we have to be as close to perfect as we can. And and at at a minimum, the good in our lives needs to outweigh the bad, or God will at a very minimum, depending on our view of God, God will be disappointed in us, if not outright angry, and he'll for sure toss us out because we're not good enough. We do our best to earn our grace, to earn our forgiveness by being as good as we're able and by doing as much good as we're able so that when we do mess up in our minds, God will be willing to forgive us. Sadly, if we're honest with ourselves, we know because we know our thoughts and our mistakes and the errors that no one else sees that the good doesn't outweigh the bad in most of us. And if it does, it still isn't perfection. We aren't morally pure. We aren't complete. We aren't perfect. No matter how hard we try to be that perfect person, 
No matter how hard you try to be that perfect spouse, no matter how hard you try to be that perfect parent, no matter how hard you try to be that perfect employee, that perfect friend, that perfect person, you and I all make mistakes. And so we wake up tomorrow and we try even harder and it's a losing game. Now we call that attitude... That approach to life in Christ, we call that legalism. And legalism reduces a dynamic, transforming relationship with God into a set of rules, a set of do's and and don'ts, mostly don'ts. We want to look the part, and we want those around us to look the part too. And so as long as everyone looks the part, we don't really ask any questions. We just want people on the outside to look like good people and to look like they've got it all together and to not bring their problems and their challenges and their fights at home and their, uh, their loss of their job or whatever it might be. We don't want them to bring that to church. Now, it's okay to bring your illness to church because we'll pray for healing and we'll, we'll, we'll gather around you for that. But don't bring your drug addiction to church or don't bring your, your um, uh, a marital affair to church and don't bring those things that are broken inside of you. Don't bring those. And that's the attitude, that's the approach to life in Christ that Paul deals with in Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 6. We've been walking through the middle part of Romans this winter in a sermon series called Deep Grace. The first part of Romans we did last winter and spring and we call that digging deep. I was going to call it deep sin, but I figured nobody would come to church for about three months. So I called it digging deep, but that's what we dug deep into. Paul, in the first part of Romans, digs really deep into the, the sin that, that reigns in the human heart. And he wants us to kind of come out of that feeling bad about ourselves. Because he wants us to honestly look at our sin and look at the condition of our hearts and look at our souls and come to terms with who and what we are apart from Christ. And then in the middle part of the book, he begins to talk about uh, grace. Because, and he starts with sin, not grace, because he knows until we understand sin, we'll never really understand how deep God's grace is, how truly amazing God's grace is. So turn with me to the next passage up. It's the the opening verses of Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Don't get any ideas. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way, in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. So, so from the beginning, basically, humanity has tried to reduce a dynamic relationship with God to a list of, of rules. Just tell me what I can do and what I can't do. Like, like, where's the fence? What are the boundaries? When I chat with people who are visiting Christ Church, I often uh, answer questions like, well, well, what do you guys say about drinking alcohol? Or what, what kind of music's okay to listen to? Or what kind of TV and movies are okay to watch? Or what about smoking? What about divorce? Stuff like that. And, and I usually respond with, well, there isn't, uh, that, that isn't a can or can't issue. It's more about your, re- so we'll talk about alcohol. It's more about your relationship with alcohol. If you're an alcoholic working a 12-step program, I wouldn't drink. If not, you need to be aware of, of, of that relationship and what it's like. How deep is it? Do you drink because you need it or because you enjoy it? Um, do you drink consistently to the point where it's impacting your relationships and your ability to work? Uh, or to the point where you're putting yourself and others in danger? For, for many people, there's nothing wrong with having a beer or two in the evening or enjoying drinks at friend, with friends at a party. For others, it's the worst possible thing you could do for yourself and for everyone around you. So it's not a can or can't issue. 
it isn't a black or white issue. There isn't a one-size-fits-all answer, but we tr keep trying to come up with one-size-fits-all answers for everybody, not just ourselves, but everybody around us. And we try to get everybody to fit into that mold. Look at verse 5 of this passage. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Now in the Old Testament and into the time of Christ, the, the Jewish people had a system of laws and rules and regulations by which they were expected to live. And the foundation of that was the law that was given by God, God's moral law. But it, they expanded on it and added to it. They meant well when they did it, but that's what they did. It, it all started in the Garden of Eden with one law, right? So the, 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 the rule in the Garden of Eden is you can eat whatever you want except for the fruit from this tree, right? And, and, and leave, leave, leave this tree alone. And we messed that one up, right? And, and things went, went downhill on planet earth pretty quickly. And then during the time of Moses, God gave the people the Ten Commandments, right? Now during, during uh, and that's what the rest of the Jewish law is based on, the Ten Commandments, uh, uh, really, if you look at them, they're often viewed as these really high moral principles, but they really aren't, right? I mean, worship only me, remember to rest, don't kill, and don't steal your neighbor's spouse or their stuff. That's the heart of the Ten Commandments. That isn't really high moral ground. It's actually the foundation of what it means to be human. It delineates the separation between animals and human beings. You go below those and you're acting like animals. So God was really saying in the Ten Commandments, for starters, let's not act like animals, folks. And then he added, added to that were the laws that outlined how people were to worship and how they were to atone for their sin, both individually and as people. And there were other laws that, that outlined how they were to function culturally and as a people. And, and, and those laws were designed to make them look different to the people around them, the peoples that surrounded them, because they were supposed to be a light in the darkness to those people. But the law had another purpose too. You see, over time it became clear that no matter how hard they tried, they just couldn't live according to God's moral law. They spent literally millennia trying to do it and they couldn't. So groups rose up who believed that if the people of God didn't live perfectly according to the law then God wouldn't bless them as a people. You see, they'd been sent into exile and all this bad stuff started happening and they were defeated by their enemies. And, 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 and some people began to think, well, maybe it's because we're not doing the right stuff. So they, they, they started expanding on these laws to make it literally impossible. I mean, even if you broke one of those many laws, you probably weren't breaking God's law. That was their thought. So if, we, if the line is here, let's move, let's make our laws way back here so that people can't, and, and we're going to try to be perfect as a people in, God, in God's eyes so that he will bless us again. But the harder they tried to keep the law and, and make new laws and, and rules and add those to the list, the more they broke God's law. They just couldn't do it. Pastor John Ortberg says this, he says, conforming to boundary markers, rules, lists of do's and don'ts, too often substitutes for authentic transformation. He said, the church I grew up in had its boundary markers. A, a prideful or resentful pastor could have kept his job. But if ever the pastor was caught smoking a cigarette, he would have been fired. Not because anyone in the church actually thought smoking was a worse sin than pride or resentment, but because smoking defined who was in our subculture and who wasn't. It was a boundary marker. And as I was growing up, having a quiet time became, became a boundary marker, a measure of spiritual growth. If someone asked me about my spiritual life, I would immediately think if I'd been having a regular and lengthy uh, quiet time. I remember my pastor used to say, no one will ever stand in this pulpit unless they spend two hours a day at least in prayer, a minimum of two hours a day in prayer. And I thought, well, I'm never going to be a pastor. But 
My initial thought was not, am I, am I growing more loving toward God and toward people? It's, have I been spending an hour a day? You know, because if, if pastor's doing two, then we're supposed to be able to do one, right? Boundary markers change from culture to culture, but the di- dynamic of it all remains the same. If people don't experience authentic transformation from the inside out, then our faith deteriorates into a search for boundary markers that kind of masquerade, they parade around as evidence for a changed life, but nothing inside is really changed. That's what the Pharisees were. Those folks really meant well. They were trying to help the people of God live by the word of God. But they focused on all these do's and don'ts instead of a relationship with God. Now look up at verse 1. It says, do you not know, brothers, and that word actually means brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Well, duh. Now, the word translated as binding here has the legal sense of binding force. It's, it's something you have to do. So today, speed limits have binding force on us, don't they? We have to live by them. And we have to live by lots of other traffic laws. And if we don't, we run the risk of getting a ticket. There's a price to pay for breaking the law. The law is binding on us, but that's only true as long as we're alive, right? Once we die, we're no longer bound by the law. When you die, you can speed all you want. That's, it's almost like Paul's trying to tell a joke here. And I'm going to guess that he was kind of a serious person and he, he, he makes an attempt. He probably wasn't known for being funny, more of a serious dude, but he's trying. You only have to keep the law as long as you're alive. Yeah, we know that, Paul. But then he takes this little attempt at a joke and he makes this huge point with it. Look at verses 4 and 6. Verse 4, by the way, is the hinge of this whole passage. But look at those two verses. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. And then down in verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in a new way in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Stop trying to reduce your faith, your relationship with God, to a written code, to a list of do's and don'ts. When you placed your faith in Christ, you died with Christ and were raised to new life with Christ. You're no longer under the law because you've died. You're under grace. And then he uses this analogy from marriage to make his point. And that's the whole uh, verses 2 and 3. Married woman is bound to, by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage accordingly. She will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if he dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Now, let me be clear here. Paul is not making an argument against appropriate divorce and remarriage here. All right? These verses have been used to try to do that by those who argue that divorce is never, ever, ever okay, even in in instances of abuse or neglect, and that's not appropriate. That's not Paul's point here. That isn't what Paul's saying at all. He's simply calling to mind the general commitment of marriage, which we still use, the words we still use in our marriage ceremonies, till death do us part, right? That's the goal when you go into a marriage. It doesn't always go that way, but that's the goal, till death do us part, right? That's what God calls us to. Um... And so his point is, if you're married, you're bound by law to your spouse. And if you don't honor that commitment, it's called cheating, right? It's a bad thing. But pretty much all cultures everywhere recognize that when one spouse dies, the surviving spouse is now free to remarry if he or she wishes. And he uses the example of the man dying and the woman remarrying because in that culture, uh, a husband could divorce his wife, but a wife could not divorce her husband. He could beat her. He could do anything he wanted to her. Um, Her only way out was his death. But if he died, she was free to remarry. And that's the image that Paul uses to describe what happens to us when we place our faith in Christ and begin to follow him. Only here, the law itself, which is the moral law of God, doesn't die. Jesus himself 
in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. The law doesn't die. He said, I've come not to abolish them, to, to, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. God's moral law remains. What changes is our relationship to it. Look again at verse 6, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve, in other words, we obey in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. It's no longer about do's and don'ts, it's about inner transformation. We no longer have to keep the law to be acceptable to God. Christ has satisfied the requirements of God's moral law for us, and his death has become our death, and his life has become our life. In 1 Corinthians 6.12, Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. I no longer have to live according to God's moral law in order to be acceptable to God, but now I can and should because Christ is alive in me. That's transformation. The law is no longer my master, my slave master, but Christ is like my spouse and I live in ways that please him, ways that uh, we see in God's moral law because I love him and I want to please him. The problem isn't following God's commandments. The problem is thinking that only when I do so imperfectly will I be acceptable to God. Because the real lesson that God's law teaches over the millennia is that no matter how hard I try, I can't. Not perfectly. I need forgiveness. I need grace. You see, the law shines a light on our sinfulness. That's what it's intended to do. In Christ, God provides that forgiveness and that grace. But God doesn't just forgive us and and hand us a pass to get into heaven when we die. He wants to transform our life now. And we're called to live as citizens of the kingdom of God now. And he does that not with a list of do's and don'ts, but in in the context of a dynamic, transforming relationship with him. Eugene Peterson, who's the person who wrote the, me- the message paraphrase of the Bible, uh, has a great book called Tell It Slant. And he uses this short parable that nobody ever preaches from in Luke chapter 13 uh, to make a point. It's, it's a parable about manure. Now, we have horses and llamas and alpacas at our house, and so manure is something that I notice when I read about it because I see it and I shovel it every day. But, but he uses this parable about manure, of all things, to talk about our need to practice resurrection in everyday life. So in the parable, a man has a fig tree in his vineyard that doesn't yield any fruit. And so frustrated, he says to the man who takes care of the vineyard that after three years, it's time to cut the thing down. Look, we've let this thing go for three years. We've tried to get it to produce fruit. Cut it down. Get rid of it. But the caretaker says, leave it alone for one more year. And I'll dig around it, and I'll fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then we'll cut it down. And then Eugene Peterson reflects on how this parable challenges us as believers. He says, instead of goading us into action, Jesus' manure story takes us out of action. We have just come across something that offends us, some person who is useless to us or to the kingdom of God. Is just taking up the ground, and we lose patience and either physically or verbally get rid of him or her. All right? Chop him down, chop her down, chop it down. We solve kingdom problems by amputation. Then he says, internationally and historically, killing is the predominant method of choice to make the world a better place. As human beings, that's what we do. It's the easiest, quickest, and most efficient way by far to clear the ground for someone or something with more promise. The manure story interrupts our noisy, aggressive, problem-solving mission. In a quiet voice, the parable says, hold on, not so fast, wait a minute, give me some more time. 
Let me put some manure on this tree. You see, manure is not a quick fix. It has no immediate results. It's going to take a long time to see if it makes any difference. If it's results that we're after, chopping down the tree is the thing to do. We clear the ground and make it ready for a fresh start. We, we love beginning. We love birthing a baby. We love christening a ship. We love the first day on a new job, even starting a war. But spreading manure takes none of that exhilaration. It's not dramatic work. It's not glamorous work. It's not work that gets anyone's admiring attention, believe me. Manure is a slow solution. Still, when it comes to doing something about what is wrong in the world, Jesus is known for his fondness for the minute, the invisible, the quiet, the slow. Yeast, salt, seeds, light, and manure. Manure does not rank high in the world's economy. It's refuse, it's garbage. We organize efficient and sometimes elaborate systems to collect it, to haul it away, to get it out of sight and out of smell. But the observant and wise know that this apparently dead and despised waste is teeming with life, with enzymes and numerous microorganisms. It's, it's the stuff of resurrection. And as God transforms me, He produces fruit in me. He transforms the way I relate to Him, to myself and to others, but it's not an overnight, immediate process. And so we don't give up on people, and we don't give up on ourselves, but we also don't hold people to the standard of do's and don'ts all the time, that there's this long list of rules that you've got to be living by. We invite people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we let him do his thing in their lives. And when God transforms me, he transforms the way I relate to him. He transforms the way I relate to myself. And he transforms the way I relate to you, to other people. And as my way of relating to others is transformed, he uses my life to touch those around me. To put a little manure in their lives too. You know, I spent most of my adult life working with teenagers in some way. As a therapist, as a coach, as a youth pastor, as a 4-H leader. I even lead the youth ministry here at Christ Church right now. And one of the things I've learned in over 20 years of working with teens is that middle school boys do not smell good. They also need to be reminded and sometimes forced to shower or bathe, even when they don't smell good. And I'm not talking about just at home. I've had several come to Jesus meetings with middle school boys about the value of soap mixed with water and about the power of deodorant and not wearing the same clothes every day on numerous mission trips and camps and retreats. I mean, you do not want to walk in the boys' cabin on a middle school retreat. I've been on more than one where the stench got pretty bad. But I've, I also know that sometime... As they grow, sometime between the 8th and ninth grades, usually something changes. It usually changes about the time they notice a cute girl and walk into a wall. Suddenly, they no longer have to be reminded and forced to keep themselves clean and smelling nice. They do it all on their own, right? Because they want to, not because they have to, and we're all grateful for it, right? We're like, thank God, you've noticed that you don't smell good. They didn't notice they didn't smell good. They just want to smell good for all the girls at school. Thank you, young ladies, for your help in that regard, I'm telling you. That's what happens to our relationship to God's moral law when we place our faith in Christ and begin to follow Him. We no longer try to obey out of, sen out of a sense of duty and an attempt to be acceptable to or good enough for God. Now we obey because we want to please our loving God and the Savior who gave himself up for us. We do so within the context of a relationship and his filling of our lives with his Holy Spirit and empowering us and transforming us. He died in our place. He took our just punishment upon himself. He died a physical death. He experiences that with us, but he also died a spiritual death, separation from God the Father, and he did that for us. 
we'll still experience the physical death. But we won't do it alone. Jesus has experienced that too. But we won't experience the other, the spiritual death. Because he died in our place. And we we don't follow a legalistic list of do's and don'ts. We're in a dynamic, transforming relationship with a God who loves us deeply and gave himself on our behalf. And we obey now because we can. And because we love him and we want to please him, knowing that his grace is there when we fail. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you that it's there when we fail, that it's there when we mess up, that it's there when we fall short and when we miss the mark. We thank you that because of your grace, we don't have to live in this system of thousands and thousands of do's and don'ts. But we have a dynamic, a living, transforming relationship with you. May we never replace the slow but steady work of your spirit in our lives, of our relationship with you, with the the dramatic and too fast killing that happens when we just try to live by a list of do's and don'ts. Transform us from the inside out, Lord. And may we be patient with ourselves. May we be patient with one another and with all who enter this place. For we are a people of grace, marked by grace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.